Good evening, everybody. Hello, hello. And I have had, I apparently have way too many windows open because I don't know what I'm looking at right now. <laughs> One, there we go. All right. Well, welcome to another episode of Critique Corner with me, DB Fastbinder. And me, Daniel Parker. Uh, we have a, a special show for, for you all tonight. Uh, in addition to, uh, well, uh, we're, we're not doing our box office uh, this week yeah, because. Yeah. Uh, we already did that, and if you saw the analysis on Sunday, hey, guess what? <laughs> Hunger Games is still in first place. Napoleon is still in second place. Uh, <laughs> uh, Wish is still in third place and embarrassing itself and everybody involved. Uh, Trolls yeah. is still in fourth place. Thanksgiving is still in fifth place. Nothing has changed since Sunday. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, um, but uh, um, in addition to uh, doing our normal reviews, uh, we uh, have a special guest who's going to be joining us in about an hour, uh, Edwin Acevedo. Uh, he's going to be talking about his uh, new campaign, uh, uh, Blood Bone. Oh. Yes. Now, so before we get started, I wanted to sh say that um, a few th interesting things showed up in the mail. Mm, yes. Uh, ah. I got, got my Guardian Angel box and calendar. Nice. I, I also got have the poster tube, but as I always do, I'm leaving it closed until I know where I'm putting it. And I got the Trident box. Nice. I got, I got my preferred cover. Cool. Got my uh, got my book here. My copy of the first book, I believe. Yeah, that's yeah, that's part one. Yeah. Okay. Thought I recognized that cover. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, you could tell this is a live unboxing video. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I got a whole bunch of these prints. Oh yeah, uh, that print I could have demonetized. Oh, that oh, print, is it also the, could have uh... demonetized. <laughs> uh, uh, that one's safe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're monetized in the first place, but YouTube doesn't like things that it. We consider it a demonetization movie. Uh, one features the, el the fire elemental in a state of um, human torch dress, if you will. Uh, yes, uh, I think I've got that one right up there. You can't see it on screen for obvious reasons. Yes, and then and, uh, uh, Jessica in bedroom clothing. Uh, yes. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I have not. I have not unfortunately had a chance to read it just yet, but that is on the agenda for this weekend time allowing it's been kind of a crazy week yes well well uh, uh no rush on that uh you know obviously you know, take your time um but uh but yeah so uh we've we got some uh, really uh good stuff and not so good stuff to talk about <laughs> with our reviews yes. uh, uh, and we're gonna start with the thing that probably would have been more uh, algorithm friendly to talk about last week, but it seems like discussion of this has largely died. Yeah. Very quickly. We've got a uh, Scott Pilgrim takes off. Now you might say, DB, why did you pick a sample image of the show that does not actually feature the title character, Scott Pilgrim? <laughs> 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 mm. oh, why why is that dv mm. yeah all right so <laughs> let's kind of get this out of the way um this review is going to have spoilers because it is hard to discuss this show in a way that does not actually spoil the premise right um because the uh the phrase online about this is that it is a another bait and switch bait Bait and switch. There, there we go. Now I'm in the camera. Quote unquote, quote unquote, yes. <laughs> Bait and switch. Uh, uh, what it really is is an alternate telling that they really did not. Yeah, they pulled another He Man. They were not yeah. upfront and honest about what the show actually was. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The when you when we actually did the the trailer reaction uh, to mm -hmm. to this and. It's basically just the first episode that was in the, the clips from the first episode was in that trailer. Yeah, and the first episode looks like it's a straightforward adaptation of the Scott Pilgrim versus the World comic book. Right. Um, and uh, as you watch that episode, you get to the end where uh, the first of Ramona's evil exes shows up. Um, um, Matt, what's his name? Matt, right. Um, he, Matt Patel. That's it. 
Yeah. And he, uh, they're about, he's about to, you know, he goes in to fight Scott Pilgrim. And then just as, you know, and this happens, it appears that Scott Pilgrim is killed. Yes. The, he, a bunch of coins fly around. Yeah. yeah. Which, which in the video gamey world of Scott Pilgrim means death. Yes. Um, uh, and so, uh, so now that Scott Pilgrim is dead, the, the story is just completely different now. Uh, it focuses on, uh, focuses on Ramona and she figures out that, uh, you know, she's trying to figure out, uh, well, well, she, she puts two and two together that, uh, that Scott didn't actually die. That he got pulled through mm -hmm. a, a vegan portal. <laughs> yeah. Which it occurs to me, boy, it, this so on, on a scale of one to ten, how would you rate this show's ability to be understandable by somebody who had not read the comic or watched the movie? Uh, two and a half, maybe three. Yeah. So <laughs> it occurs to me we just launched it to it assuming people would know what it was. Let's just take a step back here. The it's... original Scott Pilgrim vs. the World was a series of black and white comics that were later colorized, released by. A gentleman named Brian Lee O'Malley over at um, Oni Press, I believe. Uh, he uh, the, the series is basically uh, the series is one of the last great American successes in comic books. Like it was, it was really big in the 2000s. There's there's even a song about called Ramona Flowers destroyed an entire generation of women. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> to kind of talk about the influence of, well. You know, jokingly talking about the, or maybe not so jokingly talking about the influence of the show, yeah, or yeah, the, yeah. the comic. The yeah. movie came out. The movie was a modest, well, it was a flop, but it, it's one of those flops that has a cult following. So, mm -hmm. it's it's probably broken even in the long run. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But, it's, yeah, the, that movie had a lot of um, kind of big actors now that there were uh, a lot of a lot of people who were superheroes. Uh, like yeah. uh, some of the actors went on to be things in the CW for DC. Uh, Brie Larson is a character. Uh, Chris Evans is a character. The guy who was in Superman 2006 was the, was the character. Yeah. Brandon yeah. Routh. Was um, it? Brandon Routh. Yeah. Routh, that's it. Um, um, but yeah, so the, the basic premise is it's basically a video game plot starring a directionless young man, young slacker named Scott. Right. Um, you know, he. He is dating a high schooler, which everybody, uh, you know, uh, calls him out about, rightfully so, as he is 23. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and while he is dating this high schooler, Knives, on the, who is on the left there, mm. he meets this indie girl named Ramona Flowers, and he decides to date her, and basically she has a bunch of evil exes who she dumped and were but heard about it and anybody who tries to date her must go through the gauntlet of the seven evil exes. Yes. Um, and, uh, the, in, in like a video game plot, each evil X is a varying, a different, ver different, higher level of, um, uh, uh, difficulty. Right. Right. Ending with Gideon. Right. Um, who is the mastermind of the whole thing. Now, um, my understanding is that since the comic and the movie came out, Brian Lee O'Malley got divorced from his wife, and that might have influenced some of the creative decisions that were that they allowed for this show. Because uh, it is not again, it is not focused on Scott in any way, except Scott is almost like the damsel in distress. To an extent, because yeah, like he he does not really contribute to the plot significantly. No, he doesn't. Uh, you know, he just kind of um, he, he's he's more of the plot device. Yeah, right. It's like um, Ramona has to investigate why Scott disappeared. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, and then. Um, so that's kind of like the that's the first level of spoiler where it's basically, you know, the, hey, this this is not a straightforward adaptation of it. That's why it has a different name. Yeah, uh, there is a second season apparently that's there. They've talked about working on though. I'll be curious if that actually gets greenlit if it hasn't been officially because again, it's I, I did not see it in the trending on Netflix any of the times I was watching it. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and Netflix is very wishy-washy when it comes to renewing their shows. You know, sometimes they'll say, oh, yeah, we're bringing it back. And then, like, uh, and then like a week or two later, they'll change their mind and cancel it. Oh, we didn't get the numbers we were after. Sorry. Right, yeah. Cowboy Bebop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but um, so, so, so before we get into, like, the second layer of spoilers, which would be like actually talking about the ending or things like that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about this from like a production level. Yeah. Uh, so they actually got the original cast from the movies to come back to voice the characters. Yes. Um, so I, uh, there were, there were some of them who came off a little bit stilted, which I don't necessarily fault them for because, um, you know, voice acting and physical acting are different skills. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, highlights are Ramona's actress, whose name escapes me, but she uh, did a good job. Uh, Mary Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Um, That's right. She um, uh, re most recently she played Harrison Dula in Ahsoka. Oh, yeah. Um, well, th then this is probably the uh, <laughs> the better <laughs> performance. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other one that really stood out to me as a good performance was actually Brie Larson as uh, the girl in the middle there, who is just kind of an awful, awful oh, that was person. Our, that's uh, that's Aubrey Plaza. Is that Aubrey Plaza's character? That's, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, wait, no, 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 no. I'm you're right. Aubrey yeah. Plaza's character was I actually kind of thought she was one of the ones who was maybe slightly stilted compared to normal. I'm thinking of Ev, of uh, Envy Ed Adams, who was yeah. Brie Larson's character. Right. Yeah. Uh, she she did a great job of just like hamming it up as this angry valley girl. Yeah. Uh, well, you know that that um, that, that that's a role she's she was born to play. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna like so honestly like as much of a plank of wood as she is as Captain Marvel, mm -hmm. she can act. It's just that the, that character had nothing to sink into. I say if they if and when they make a Barbie sequel, Brie Larson should be the villain. It would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, as far as the animation goes, uh, this is a pretty faithful redoing of the or. Um, adaptation of the comic book style, mm -hmm. which has its ups and downs. Uh, you know, the characters are, are kind of simplistic looking. It's kind of a chibi-ish style. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh, what was the show that the, the anime that you said oh, it was uh, kind of like Panty and Stocking with Garter Belt? Yeah, it, it's like a it's like a version of that but with smoother animation. For those who don't know, Panty and Stocking was uh, Gainax Studios basically being inspired by things like Powerpuff Girls and really crass American adult cartoons to just make something over the top and edgy <laughs> with cheap animation. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like uh, the animation itself was mostly good where it needed to be. Um, the, the fight scenes they had were pretty inventive mm -hmm. and they had a lot of interesting angles to them. Uh, so the like just interesting camera angles, interesting shots, interesting set pieces. Um, so from like a production standpoint, no real issues. Um, the okay, so I think we're ready for that second layer of spoilers. Yes. So if you're if you're you know, you know what I like that I like the Scott Pilgrim just fine. I'm cool with having a couple of little spoilers. Uh, I, I, I'm going in knowing it's a Ramona Flowers show. Uh, stop now. Go watch it. And, and hopefully you enjoy yourself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For those of you who go, so, okay, what's, what's the deal here? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Um, Scott Pilgrim pulled off a rare twofer here. He is both the damsel in distress and the villain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh what uh what happens is uh in the in the fu they in the future, which is what was it like 20 years I think? He 20 was like years, yeah. late 30s. 
Yeah, so um, it would probably be, I don't know, maybe like a few years from now for us, um, even though the technology didn't really match up. Oh, that's but... right. Yeah, Scott Pilgrim takes place in the early 2000s, so, or mid-2000s. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, technically, yeah. he'd yeah, he'd be right around now. But they have, like, hover bus and... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but so, uh, so Scott Pilgrim in the future, uh, he basically concocts this scheme uh, with the help of uh, two of Ramona's evil exes who are twins. Uh, they're in a, like a, a, a band together in the future. That's, you know, they, they sing a lot of J-pop songs. Um, to, to dozens of views on YouTube. Can't imagine what that's like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so uh, he, concocts this whole scheme with the with the, the twins and they have the uh, robot who is a vegan robot uh, oh I, I don't know how that works yeah. uh, technically he has never eaten meat which in the world of scott pilgrim gives you superpowers yeah uh, yeah <laughs> so uh so he the, the robot makes the vegan portal and brings scott to the future and old scott is doing that because he's trying to keep his younger self from marrying ramona because they end up getting divorced Right, which actually turned out to be a bit of an exaggeration because she said she needed space, and he interpreted that as flake out. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, um, man. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the ending scene to this... The, were, were they trying to go for, like, a Dragon Ball-type ending? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, and basically the ending is that future Ramona and present Ramona merge. Their hyper Ramona powers let them defeat the future Scott Pilgrim, who has trained himself into basically a old grizzled version of Ryu from Street Fighters, who can beat everybody easily. Yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, then they have a, then they have a teaser for a second season. Yeah. Uh, if I don't sound excited as I describe this, it's because. <laughs> The, the show has a lot of the show has good qualities to it. I would say a lot of the actual episodes are pretty interesting. Yeah, they they kind of uh, some of the some of the jokes I thought were were pretty good. I mean, um, I, I did like the whole thing with um, with Chris Evans uh, was was it Lucas Lee when he um, and hey D Ryan, good to see you. Um, sounding like this in every scene. Sounding like this in every scene, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then he and uh, he and Gideon or uh, Gideon become good friends, and then you find out Gideon's real name is is uh, Gordon Goose, because of course you know half of Canada is named Gordon, right? Gordon <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and then the uh, young Neil cracked me up. <laughs> yeah, he's just a complete idiot. <laughs> yeah. He's, um, that's what I would say the strength of this show is, is that you get to de it develops characters who, like in Scott's story, they were obstacles who were killed off, mm -hmm. or they were minor characters who didn't get to do much. Um, uh, where in this one, they get to, they get a lot of focus. Like you, you learn more about most of the evil exes, except funnily enough, the twins who in the movie were also the least developed evil exes. Yeah. It's, like the, it's like the screenwriter of this, who's not Brian Lee O'Malley, it's somebody else who came in to do it. Yeah. Like looked at what he had available for the twins and just said, they are my plot device. Cool. <laughs> Moving yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so then as far as, um, uh, hmm. now, as far as things I don't really care for, um, the show still didn't really make me love Ramona. Like I kind of under, I don't, like I, it, it kind of fleshes her out a little bit. You get to see her be like a little bit sorry for how she treated her exes in the past. Yeah. But the show is. You know, you, the show is kind of in love with her. Like it assumes that you're into Ramona, or interested yeah. in Ramona. Yeah, and and I, I I thought most Scott Pilgrim fans like preferred knives. <laughs> that that's the overall impression I got. And like yeah. with the premise of Scott Pilgrim dying, and uh, I, if you actually 
committed to the bit and had Scott die, if, if I'd been given that prompt, I would have gone, oh, well, you know, Knives is the focus character and she's on a revenge quest, which is about the futility of revenge and her realizing that Scott wasn't that great to start with. <clears throat> which probably would have made for a more interesting show. <laughs> yeah. Um, like this wasn't bad, but it kind of like as good as the performance was for Ramona, still just not my favorite character. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I the other thing about it is by the nature of it being a time travel alternate universe plot, it does kind of end up replacing the original Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Yeah, uh, except for um, yeah, except for when when future Ramona goes back and writes the screenplay for young Neil and then they're making the movie of it. <laughs> yeah. Trying was, to make the movie of it. That was weird and meta. Like that was, yeah. Uh, um, but um, yeah. So the thing is like Scott Pilgrim is always a series I've been very lukewarm on. I liked the movie well enough. I've seen it a couple of times. The, the comic book, I actually found kind of a slog to get through. Mm just because, well, Scott and Ramona are tiresome, toxic people. And the story is line is about them getting better. But it just wasn't that interesting moment to moment to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the other thing is that this Scott basically doesn't get to achieve anything. He basically shows up again. They confront the evil exes. Then Scott Pilgrim from the future shows up, beats everybody up, and then Ramona solves the day. Yeah. Which, yeah, you know, hmm. <clears throat> which again, if you if you like Ramona, you know that's great. But you know, like, right? Eh. If, and the thing is that I, I watched a I watched an episode of Night's Watch over on Shad's channel, where they had one of his regulars on there who was apparently a Scott Pilgrim super fan. Okay. <laughs> uh, like he he had finally convinced his wife to watch the show, and when they got to the end of the first episode, and she realized it was different, like. She kind of saw that as, well, my contract is uh, my contract is fulfilled. I don't have to watch this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and he he talked about looking at his shelf and all the collection of comics and the video game and stuff on there, and being very sad to realize he was probably never going to get the actual adaptation of the show he loved in his lifetime. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so. That that was one that was one fan who was very let down by this. Um, now I've seen other people. The thing is, like, I, I don't take it, I don't take it seriously on Twitter when people talk about enjoying things. I'm sorry, I just <laughs> I just can't. There's enough bots on there and things like that that you can't necessarily take it as an actual endorsement. Yeah, which yeah. is mostly where I saw people talking good things about it. Maybe it's the YouTube algorithm. Maybe it's because the YouTube algorithm talk, likes taking hot takes and piss takes and other takes i did not i'm not seeing a lot of love for this except except for call me chato yeah he's the only one i've seen so far that enjoyed that has enjoyed the show yeah i uh, which fair enough mm. um i i would say but like the thing is that the thing with scott pilgrim is that he's a god this sounds pathetic to say he's kind of the luke skywalker of a certain generation of young men yeah uh. Uh, uh, maybe not as extreme, but basically he is a character who I've met more than one Scott Pilgrim in my time. I have two, yeah. <laughs> like, a young directionalist, young directionalist jerk who just sponges off the world and contributes nothing. And it's about him realizing his flaws and becoming a better person. Mm -hmm. Which that's a, I can see where that's a story that would be meaningful to a lot of 20-somethings. Yeah. 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 So having that yanked away and given to Ramona, <laughs> and, and that's the and that's the new continuity, where Scott doesn't even get to fight the evil exes. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. And also the evil exes all survive, so I guess they're around for the second season, though they contribute all uh, absolutely nothing to the end fight with old Scott Pilgrim. No, they just get their butts kicked. Yeah. Instantly. So it's yeah. like okay. Cool. Uh, and, and and Ninja, good to see you, man. Uh, and he asks, uh, "Is it wrong for me to actually like the twist of the series? It makes me more interested." No, um, no. 
Uh, like I, I'm talking about, if you're actually a fan of the original material to a large extent, you're going to be, this could be crushing. Mm -hmm. um, if you're like me and you're lukewarm, it's like, okay, I can kind of see what you're doing there. But then I feel, I always feel sympathy for fans of things that get a weird adaptation. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Like the, the example that was hammered into me is like, what if you were the, like the biggest green Hornet fan in the world? And your one swing at the bat was the Seth Rogen version. Yeah, or uh, <clears throat> or or the aforementioned He Man, not just with the 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 Netflix show, but also the the live action movie with Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> yeah, he He Man has now had two swings at the bat of a proper media adaptation. I mean, I guess they got that two thousands cartoon show that was that people really liked. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, oof. But, you know, uh, if if this sounds interesting to you, then it is a it is a good enough watch. Yeah, there were moments yeah. that annoyed me, moments that didn't annoy me. I would put my enjoyment at like a seven out of ten. Yeah, I give it a six. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It is what it is. Yeah, uh, I will say though, um, they I, I I kind of brushed by this when we were talking about the the um, X is getting some development. And I would never have thought that I wanted more of the first Evil X, Matt Patel. There's a reason I remember his name when I'm off with names. He's great at this show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so good on him. I, I really liked yeah. that. that he, him surviving added a lot to the show. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, when he takes over uh, Gideon's company and everything. Yeah. Uh, and it says uh, they also had a children's show that was released alongside. Oh, yeah, I remember seeing that and he-man was a real hero you know i almost wonder what how it would have so it's interesting is that on netflix they do actually have scott pilgrim versus the world the movie at, mm -hmm. available so technically you could watch that then watch this if you're unfamiliar with it this does seem like more of a sequel to the movie than the comics yeah yeah i think so too yeah i i've only watched the movie once um i may have to go back and watch it again the one thing I thought, like the the character who is my bellwether for what version of things you're adapting, is the vegan guy, uh, yeah. because uh, in the comic he was like he was very full of himself. He was very uh, conceited, but he seemed like he was somewhat he was somewhat clever. Yeah. In the movie, he was a complete dumbass, <laughs> and this seems to and this seems to follow that characterization more. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just like the, the the whole thing in the movie where he's, he's like, he, yes, he's vegan, which means he's better than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's it's a silly it's a silly show. Still, it has some ups and downs. I didn't love it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. If you did, I can kind of squint and see why. Yeah. Although, um, like you, I was very annoyed by the the animation sequence of Ramona changing her hair every episode yeah every episode ramona changed her hair color because that's one of her character traits from the comic and uh it was the same animation every time yeah just with different hair color yeah but uh but yeah now uh speaking of things i did love a friend and i actually went to the uh godzilla minus one fan preview that they had last night Ooh. Now, what's interesting is that I knew multiple people who went to this thing. Apparently, Washington State has the most sedate moviegoers ever. <laughs> because people in Tennessee, like my friend in Tennessee was talking about how the audience cried and gasped and applauded. Yeah. <laughs> that did not happen at my showing. Then again, we had about 20 people versus their 60. And, and, and most of, uh, how many of those 20 were, were stoned? <laughs> um. Because it is Washington. Yeah, fair question. I, I wasn't paying attention. Hopefully the six-year-old girl who kept having to get up to go to the bathroom wasn't one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but all right. Um, Godzilla minus one. Basic premise for Godzilla minus one. Uh, it, it is a movie that is made by Toho, so this is not in the MonsterVerse continuity. Um, okay. It is a. It is also, as far as I can tell, like... You could maybe squint and have it be in the original series continuity. It's just you'd have to explain why people didn't recognize Godzilla when he showed up again in the 50s. Uh, yeah. um, also, is 
his power set seems to be a bit different in this one. So it, that's one of those things where th these aren't movies known for consistency anyway. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the original Godzilla was made in the fifties and Godzilla was a metaphor for the atomic bomb. He is actually something a little bit different this time. Uh, this is a very much a character study, not of Godzilla himself. And uh, pull this up. Uh, so Koichi Shuki, uh, Shikishima is a former kamikaze pilot from World War II. Now, I will give you a moment to wrap your head around what's the problem with that statement. <laughs> Well, usually the kamikaze pilots die. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so basically, this movie is about uh, it's about Shikishima who ends up um, pretending that his plane is having mechanical problems and he lands on this island in the South Pacific, where they have uh, where they have a, an air base set up. This is during the island hopping campaign. Okay. As the Americans were closing in on the Japanese mainland, mm -hmm. and uh, in the middle of the night, this giant T-Rex-looking thing shows up, <laughs> and uh, it's a uh, and Shikishima freezes up when he's called on to use his uh, Zero's twenty-millimeter cannons to try to kill Godzilla. Mm. And this results in the death of everybody on the whole island except for him and the lead mechanic, who hates him. Yeah, of course. <laughs> because, you know, he didn't do his job. He gets back to a bombed out uh, Tokyo, mm. which I... Uh, so one of, the, one of the things they don't show in the movies as much about World War II is just how... Like, people are like, oh, the atomic bomb was so awful. It was, if you were killed by the atomic bomb, it was a cleaner death than some of the firebombing campaigns they were doing on the Japanese mainland. Because yeah. Japanese cities at the time were mostly wood and rice paper, which uh, burns real good. Yeah. yeah. I, I believe that they were uh, using early forms of napalm for some of these firebombings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you've ever seen um, Grave of the Fireflies, yeah, it's exactly. Like that. Yeah. So he gets back to a Tokyo that is basically rubble. That, that's actually where the title is: Godzilla minus one. And it's not only just before the first movie; it's Japan when it isn't even at ground zero. It's at negative development. Ooh, man. And so uh, it's him dealing with the like the massive amount of survivors' guilt. People tell him he didn't do his job. You know, we we could have won if you'd done your duty. Somebody tells him. Yeah. Even though you yeah. know, the kamikaze pilots didn't really accomplish much. No, they didn't. At least on a strategic level. Yeah. Um, and uh, he ends up befriending a woman named Noriko and her adopted daughter, who was basically given to her by her dying mother. Mm. So, like, it's just a, they end up being a little family together that isn't bound by anything. Mm. And then. Godzilla shows up again after the atomic testing turns him from a T-Rex sized animal, more or less yeah, <laughs> into a, a building sized beast. Yeah. <laughs> and it's about the efforts of the Japanese populace, not the Navy, not the U S occupiers, just the Japanese populace to try to fight this thing off. Mm. So that's about as much as I want to get into the actual plot of it, because spoiler alert, I really loved this movie. Uh, right. I was actually not expecting to love this movie. And I'll tell you why I was not expecting to love this movie. Um, right. I've ended up seeing a lot of kaiju movies and TV shows uh, in the last few years because I have some friends who are very much into that. Yeah. I uh, guess what the number one complaint I usually have about these shows is. Uh, what's that? that? I don't give a crap about the characters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are some character focused Ultraman shows like Jeed that have my interest, but at the end of the day, they are there to portray, yeah, you know, they're they're just there to sell toys and have a big rubber suit fight or CGI kaiju fight. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> like I, I remember when I saw Godzilla King of the Monsters, the MonsterVerse one, and I gave the movie more credit because I hadn't seen the first of those MonsterVerse Godzilla movies. Oh. <laughs> and I'd assumed, oh, this character here must have been like this main guy here must have been the main character from the previous movie, which he was not. <laughs> which meant the fact that they didn't explain all that much about him <laughs> that's more explicable in my mind yeah <laughs> this is the only kaiju movie i have ever seen where you would have still had an interesting storyline even if the god even if the kaiju was completely excised from the movie ah <laughs> you would have just had a story of found family and survivor's guilt and other stuff and him like he would have had to deal with it in a different way than getting basically a second chance to um defend his homeland okay yeah. Yeah. um yeah it's like i i will say for godzilla himself he actually he is not in the movie as much as more recent entries this is actually kind of welcome because it makes it have more impact when he does show up and just the production design on this in general is brilliant. Uh, mm. Like uh, they, they are so good at building tension. Mm. Like think think about a Godzilla movie. How often are you actually afraid for the common or for the people in the streets during a Godzilla movie? Like okay, just you know, it's just carnage and body count, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> There's a scene where Godzilla picks up a subway car or a train car, and someone yeah. is dangling out of it, and I was legitimately terrified for them. Oh wow! Like I can't yeah. think of the last time I saw a Godzilla movie that actually made me feel, and it did that because it has such strong character beats and growth and everything. Oh. Like you just you get you get legitimately invested in the cast. Yeah, uh, wow. That's uh, yeah, like, like you're saying for for a Godzilla movie, that is uh, that's pretty astonishing. <laughs> yeah, um, but like they, they're so uh, again, like this is a Godzilla who technically might not be as powerful as some versions of him though he does some pretty crazy crap like throwing ships hundreds of feet around just like casually <laughs> but uh they're very good at making you feel every moment hmm. it's it's also a semi-realistic thing I, I won't spoil what their final plan is to kill godzilla but it's based on okay like in the original they had to invent invent a whole oxygen destroyer super weapon yeah, <laughs> uh, that based on nonsense science. Uh, yeah. This one, it's like, okay, you know what? This is a plausible enough plan based on my high school chemistry knowledge. <laughs> At least the way you're presenting it seems reasonable. Yeah. Uh, and then Ninja asks, uh, "Does did he perform the run?" Right. No. Uh, right. That's the thing is he faked engine problems, and uh, the head mechanic is like, "You know, I didn't see any problems with your plane." Uh. <laughs> Right. The, the other thing about this is it's basically it's kind of like the so in, in every war there are people who are people who commit atrocities there are people who but there are people who are just fighting for their homeland to protect the people they love mm. and as much as you know we americans can and the allied countries in general can think of germany and japan and italy as just you know mustache twirling villains mm -hmm. uh there were a lot of decent people who were just kind of caught up in a situation outside of their control. Yeah. Um, this movie is basically like, it's, it's like giving the Japanese military a worthy foe, like a, a fight that you could actually feel good about. Cause, cause when you think about it, uh, there was like a big buildup for an invasion or for an American conventional invasion of the Japanese homeland that never happened. Right. So maybe I'm reading more into this than they meant, but there's like a level where the it's like they never had their real test of strength, right? Or they never had, like, they were built up for it and then the government just capitulated. Yeah. After the atomic bombings, which I do not blame them. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Who wants to deal with more of that? Uh, no. <laughs> um, but... Um, but yeah, so it's uh, I, I could it it definitely it it kind of spoke to me as somebody who is like it, it gave me an alternate perspective on the history of this. And uh, Ninja asks, 
So is it more historically accurate than Ridley's wife's boyfriending of Convolian? <laughs> <laughs> uh, from what I've heard about Napoleon, yes. Uh, hey, Daniel, did you know that there was trench warfare during the Napoleonic Wars? Apparently that's, that's what they portray in the movie. Uh, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, you, there's a reason you don't remember that from any other adaptation you've ever seen of that. It, yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure yeah, that, uh, that doesn't happen for about 100 years. <laughs> yeah, like, there was like a little bit of it during the Civil War, like late Civil War. Mm -hmm. There's a level where if European generals had paid more attention to the like late American Civil War, they could have done better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> because the weaponry was similar enough that they were having to do, go to the similar. Uh, Nin Ninja says uh, they existed, but not at Waterloo. Yeah. Well, and not the way they're showing it, from what I've yeah. heard. Is it? But uh, anyway, uh, back to this. Back to a good movie. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Godzilla minus one starts this weekend. Uh, the, again, I was at a special preview. Um, I can't see how it did on that special preview because it's it's one of those things where it's going to be rolled into the Friday box office. But I really hope this movie catches on. It, the thing is that it is subtitle only, so that has advantages and disadvantages depending on your preferences. Yeah. But I will, I will say there's some dynamite performances, excellent character work. Uh, it made me care about things. Um, if, if you're if now if you're just the kind of Godzilla fan who just wants to see a big slobber knocker fight between multiple kaiju or just scene after scene of Godzilla wrecking shit, um, there, there's some of that, but it's not what the movie's about. Uh -huh. So it's, it's more of a thinking man's Godzilla movie. Wow. <laughs> so uh, take the, take that as you will. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, I'll definitely check this movie out and i might do it uh i don't know if i'll see it in the theater but i'll definitely watch it on digital or you know if it's I have, a, service. I have a sneaking suspicion this will end up on netflix just because netflix has multiple original godzilla properties on there so they seem to be in bed with toho okay yeah all right awesome uh, well um last thing before we get to our uh resident or our uh, our comic book shelling and our special guest. Yes. Let's talk about our classic movie review, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which I had never seen before. Really? Yeah. Huh. I could see certain clips from it, but um, so, so it, it, you know, I sometimes have to realize that my family has interesting tastes in movies. I mentioned I was watching, like, when my dad will, like, I'll sometimes say, oh, yeah, I'm watching X, and my dad will say, why? <laughs> And that was kind of his reaction to this one. <laughs> like, why? Like, okay, there's a reason this was not my one of my childhood staples. Like, it seems to have been for you. Oh, oh yeah, it was. Yeah, um, yeah. That, it, watched this quite a few times with my family. Although when I was younger, my parents would have to fast forward through a certain scene in the movie. Uh, if you know, it, 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 if you've seen the movie before, it's the movie. It's the scene that earned the movie its R rating. <laughs> <laughs> I don't effing know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it's a rare uh, Thanksgiving film that is actually a Thanksgiving film. Yeah, um, uh, in, which I, I'm not entirely sure why that's the case. I think it's because it's an, a uniquely American holiday, and I guess it doesn't play well overseas. Yeah. And also, there's a level where Christmas has like a culmination event. Like, you know, you can, or there's multiple ways to end a Christmas movie, and it, Mm -hmm. It's like it's also towards the tail end of the year, so it it, it lends itself more to like uh, you know introspection and whatnot. Where Thanksgiving for a lot of people is just well, going to add an extra two thousand calories of pie and stuffing a day to my normal diet. So, yeah. yeah, watch some football, see some family I don't like, and uh, then go spend too much money. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But uh, but yeah, so um, uh, so this movie uh, is a classic '80s comedy um, starring, uh, as you can see, uh, Steve Martin and John Candy. Uh, it was written and directed by John Hughes, um, who most people will remember from like Ferris Bueller, uh, uh, Breakfast Club, uh, Sixteen Candles. Uh, he wrote. Uh, home alone um this is uh oh and he directed uncle buck which is another 
movie with John Candy. That one I have seen a bunch of times. Yeah. So I hope that redeems me a little bit. Oh yeah, it does. Yes. Um, this, but this was actually the first movie that John Candy and John Hughes uh, worked together. Um, and uh, their their collaboration, of course, was pretty, uh, you know, uh, pretty well known. It, when the two of them worked together, it was it was like like comedy gold. And uh, and yes, Digito, yeah, this uh, John Hughes movie. Um, I didn't realize that Uncle Buck was too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but yeah. So uh, basic plot of the movie is Steve Martin is uh, is an ad executive in, from Chicago. Uh, he's in New York on a business trip a couple of days before Thanksgiving, and he's trying to get home uh, in time for the holiday. But uh, bad weather uh, keeps him from uh, flying from New York to Chicago. Um, and of course, along the way, uh, he runs into uh, John Candy's character, uh, who uh, sells shower curtain rings. <laughs> And only shower curtain rings. And only, yeah, and only shower like, curtain rings. The, the head of distribution for some territory or other. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah and, so, uh, so, yeah, uh, it turns into a classic road comedy of the two of them trying to get Steve back to Chicago to see his family. Right. Um, and, uh, of course, yeah, it's, yeah, hijinks and hilarity ensues. Um, and part of the whole, uh, the, the whole comedy uh, shtick of the movie is that Steve Martin's character is just a real uptight jerk. Yes. Now, I'll be fair, I can understand him in every single scene. Yeah, I, I can too. Yeah, because so, a lot of the things happen to him that, yeah, would 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 irritate the, the hell out of me too. Would, um, would irritate a literal saint. It, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, and and of course, and then John Candy's character uh, is just uh, he he's good natured and charming, but he is really annoying. <laughs> he, he's a complete bore. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and he's a slob. He tells boring stories. Yeah. He yeah. Uh, he won't shut up. Right. He snores. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he smokes. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. And, uh, and so, but through the course of the movie, though, um, he, the, the, the two of them are basically kind of just, and, and no matter, and, and Steve Martin, by the way, he spends a lot of the movie trying to get rid of him. Like he's trying yes. to get away from him. But fate keeps bringing them back together. Yes. Um, you know, they, they, they end up spending the night in a really bad, a sleazy motel room in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, <laughs> a classic mistake, like uh, starting a land war in Asia. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, then you know they hop on a train, and then they try to go to uh, try to take the train to Chicago, but then the train breaks down, and you know then they they end up on the bus, but they can only get the bus only goes to St. Louis, and yeah, and then uh, S Steve Martin tries to rent a car in St. Louis, but then the car isn't there, and then that leads to. Um, as I said, the aforementioned scene that earned the movie its R rating. <laughs> with with an actress who I recognized as the uh, secretary from Ferris Bueller. Yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Uh, oh, and um, uh, at the beginning of the movie, uh, Steve Martin's friend from his work friend that he's talking to, or his, he, his friend's telling him, well, oh, just take the eight o'clock to Chicago. You know, you're not going to make the six o'clock flight. That the, I don't remember the actor's name, but he played Ferris Bueller's dad. Oh, okay. So there's yeah. a few uh, recurring people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Hughes. I, I guess John Hughes really liked working with the same actors. Um, and um, uh, but uh, yeah. So then, uh, but John Candy manages to get a car, and then of course it just goes, just gets really bad. Completely and probably my completely yeah. hell. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> my 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 favorite scene in the uh, favorite scene in the movie is when they end up driving the wrong way on the highway. And they're going in between the two semi trucks. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of scenes in this where, um, I, so okay, so I watched this in like a bad situation. For mm -hmm. which I mean, like, like I was watching it on a. Uh, that's just a delivery, so I don't have to worry about it. Okay, hooray for holiday shopping. Anyway, yes. I, I was watching it on my iPad in my room as I was, you know, going to sleep. 
I it kept me up. <laughs> but I could see yeah, this isn't one that needs a great screen or a great audio. Right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so yeah, so th this one doesn't have a plot that you have to dig into as much because it is it's a road comedy, comedy of errors, mm -hmm. situation based things. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the things I thought was interesting is that John Candy's character is objectively an awful person. Okay. Like he steals on multiple occasions. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, that's, one of the better scenes is when he's trying to raise them some travel money and he just, he has like his shower rings and he keeps selling to people like, oh, you know, these are, you can use them as earrings. Oh, you, you, know, you, you girls like at least 18 when you're wearing those. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a replica of, uh, this, this isn't the original ancient Chinese, of course, but the, this is a replica of an ancient Chinese artifact. And yeah. uh, just like, uh, just complete bs merchant which is fitting of a salesman right yeah <laughs> um I, and I, I this one really just crystallized how steve martin's uh entire acting career could be summed up as a jerk with a heart of gold that has to come out yeah 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 um and and in in perfect john hughes fashion um you know it, his, his comedies will uh it, it kind of like james gunn um where uh it, it, his movies are funny or they're you know they, they'll have comedic elements in there but then they'll have like heart-wrenching moments or you know those moments of of uh what do i call it um heartfelt yeah, was, yeah. Oh, yeah. drama yeah. or heart, heartfelt that's a better way heartwarming 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 yeah um and you know like the like the scene when steve martin's you know chewing out john candy in the in the motel room and and you know darn it most people like me yeah he yeah he said i like me yeah <laughs> yeah and or um and of course the the ending of the movie which uh i don't know if i want to spoil it or not well it's um, not yeah yeah um but um but yeah i mean this is uh it's a a fine it, it's a one of my favorite comedies i will say um and uh, like i said yeah it's kind of a family um you know a, a traditional movie that we watch in my family yeah um the, i again i had never seen it before i had seen a couple of clips like oh, when you tell a story try to have a point it makes it so much more interesting for the listener yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i've seen some clips out of context over the years um yeah i, I really enjoyed myself on this one I, I will say that if I have like a little criticism of it, it's that um, after that highway scene, the rest of the comedy seems kind of like very tame scenes. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, especially the, all the, my favorite scene is when he is um, toward the end of the movie and he's trying to pay for a night at a hotel <laughs> uh, and, it, and how he has to do it. I won't say, but it's just, uh, just, had me laughing just because of how <laughs> pathetic it was as, yeah. he was as he was taking out his his method of payment yeah uh, oh yeah oh, oh oh yeah steve martin yeah 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 <laughs> a casio <laughs> but uh yeah i if you haven't seen it i do recommend it uh it's streaming right now on paramount plus mm -hmm. yeah um, there's also, I, I mean, mean to get it. There's a, uh, they did a 4k release of this. Um, oh. and yeah. And it's got, I think like 90 minutes of un of deleted footage on it. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I, I've been meaning to get that and watch it. Um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, um, I don't know if I, if I have any more to say about, uh, that, yeah, that's the thing about good movies and especially good comedies is that the less you have to say, it's more like, like it's less about breaking down why it does or doesn't work. Like with Scott Pilgrim or Godzilla minus one, it's more about, hey, you, are you a comedy enjoyer? Have you not seen this movie? Get out there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I recommend this too. Yeah, yeah right. I do. So uh, we have our special guest. Daniel, if you wouldn't mind getting him on, um, I think I'll go get my package and make sure I'm prepared for uh, the rest of the stream.
Of course. Yeah. yeah. Little boys' room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So I uh, just sent um, Edwin the link. So uh, Edwin, if you're watching, um, go ahead and uh, and hop in whenever you're whenever you're ready. Um, but uh, yeah. So we're gonna be um, gonna be talking about his new comic book, or I guess, or not new, but his new campaign. Um, should be. Uh, should be a good conversation to have. We always have really good conversations with Edwin um, on, on his, all of his books. Um, uh, the last time we talked to him uh, was for this book right here, Raid of the uh, Raid of the White Leopard. Uh, awesome artwork in it, by the way. Uh, really cool. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, and here is our guest right now. Hey, Edwin. Hey, perfect time. Hey. Well, well, welcome guys. back, man. How's it going? Yeah, it's good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. Always a pleasure. Yeah. So this will be the uh, third comic we've had you on for. That's your previous co uh, previous comics you've released were The oh. Ace and uh, The White Leopard. Oh, that we... Did we lose DB? I'm, oh, I'm still here. I think we lost DB. Oh, okay. You're back. <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, you were you were saying we, uh, previous books we've had with for we were talking about with Edwin. Uh, yeah, with, uh, the White Leopard and I believe it was the Ace. Yep. Yeah. So, what do you got for us this time? I'm bringing Bloodbone to everybody. You know, trying to doing this kind of introduction to the characters uh, by Ashcan. Uh, you know, to, uh, I ended up actually releasing the first version of this last year, but I only did it through PayPal. So it kind of went under the radar. And, you know, thanks to places like Fun My Comics that are, you know, open to guys like me, you know, I decided to kind of do a little kind of short campaign with a new cover and a couple additional pages to, for anybody kind of missed out on it in the first time. Okay. Yeah, so um, my, my first thought after looking over the sample pages is this is like the most 90s thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like this 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 slab of beef up here with like veins jutting out of his neck that are bigger than like bigger around than his eyes is just kind of like, wow, that that is that is some that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, but I wanted I want to take you back to like '95. You know, basically take you back to like the the comic book shop, and can you imagine between all the crazy titles, Bloodbone kind of sneaks right in there. It doesn't look out of place, so it's kind of was going for. Nope. It. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's it's funny, like, uh, and Bloodbone is kind of. Uh, well, he's a slab of beef himself, but I guess this is a slab of elephant up here. <laughs> yeah. very, very classic uh, uh, muscle man design. It looks like he skipped leg day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Donald Donald's uh, little signatures, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay. So this is Donald Delay. So that's yeah. He did. He did. Uh, he did the original twelve-page story for for the first Ash can. So yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I have like an additional those. That art right there is by Maxi Dallo. He did a four-page short story for me. Uh, that okay. It was actually for something else, and then kind of the something else was kind of up in the air, so I decided to just add this to the ash can. You know, give give oh, people yeah. that extra bonus content. Yeah. Is this kind of like how you had your White Leopard as like a part of a comics anthology, like a little teaser for the comics anthology first? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Nice. So, um, also, uh, I can kind of see the silliness of some of Donald's art here because this mobster kind of looks like a Muppet in this shot here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, you, so, yeah, you're bringing the 90s back. Uh, tell us about Bloodbone himself. So, yeah, uh, Bloodbone is basically the story of a man who uh, returns to his hometown after being gone for several years. And he uh, finds out that the city's been overtaken by this criminal organization. 
they basically bought off the cops, the politicians, and basically, you know, basically turned this once kind of thriving city into like Gotham. Kind of dark has been overtaken by criminals. A lot of like the regular populace is kind of uh, suffering because of it. And Bloodbone, you know, he, he's kind of gone through some changes while he was gone. And he decides to use uh, the skills that he learned while he was away to clean this city up and nice. become a mass vigilante and basically bring down this uh, corporation. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so a little bit um, Dark Knight Returns y. Yeah, I compare it mostly to like the first two seasons of Arrow. Oh, okay. uh, anybody who's got oh. like the first two seasons knows Oliver comes back and he's very kind of motivated. He's got like this little checklist that of criminals he's looking to take out. It borrows some of those elements. It's, it's you know, Blood Bun wasn't on, a, on an island for like years and stuff like that. You know, he, he went through his own little experience and we kind of touch on some of the stuff that happened to him, uh, you know, while he was away. Yeah, it uh, also kind of reminds me of um, what was it? Uh, Walking Tall. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of similar thing. Yeah. I, I love the expressiveness in uh, Donald's art here. Like, you, even though the guy's wearing a mask, you, you know that he's surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I got. I got to imagine. Like, yeah. I got to imagine like, me, like, sound of, like those person. hands clapping is just like <laughs> deafening in that room. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he does have like enhanced hearing, so he, he could definitely. It sounds even louder in his head. So th that was a question I had. Uh, is, is he uh, is he a superhuman or is he just a very well trained guy? Uh, I like to call him an enhanced human. Uh, you know, he's basically his body has been transformed to be basically uh, like a peak form. You'd say okay. uh, there's nothing like you know he wasn't born this way. Uh, something kind of happened to kind of change his regular kind of. You know, he's a, you know, like a typical kind of young man. And then he goes through these changes and becomes like this kind of enhanced human. Okay. So less like, uh, he's less a Superman and more of a, uh, a Captain America sort of in terms of like power yeah, level. Yeah, the closest. Yeah. Okay. I, I noticed kind of with some of the characters, um, I, I know you're a big wrestling guy. Uh, we're, we're was that uh, kind of an influence with some of the designs having like sort of the wrestle wrestling look with the, with any of them? Yeah, like he's uh, very much uh, based off like Bane, you know. Uh, okay. It, it his uh, Joe Ball actually did the original design. He had like a very Bane looking mask at first. Yeah, like he looks like it kind of went more of like a direction like a Grifter from Wildcats. Mm. Uh, you still there, Edwin? Oh, did we lose him? Uh, mm. uh oh. The mainstream comic book price is trying to suppress his comic. Uh, yeah, I know. Jeez. Go buy 30 copies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, there he is. Okay, You're he's back. back. <laughs> anyway, like I was saying, uh, the, the mask kind of reminds me of, like, Rather than the Bane Luchador mask, this is kind of making me think of Grifter from uh, Wildcats. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like one of the tweets Donald gave him. Yeah. Which is like it's definitely a unique look because. Uh, okay, so one of one of the things I realized during um, the lockdowns a few years back. But the most unrealistic part of Spider-Man isn't the super strength or the webbing. It's the fact that he can talk clearly all the time with a mask actually pressed up against his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Th th this seems like you'd be having have an easier time making yourself heard. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, if, if this does well, are you planning to uh, make a second issue of this? Or what's what's next on your schedule? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I already have plans on doing a full Blood Bowl number one, uh, probably around this time next year. I already have uh, pages in and everything. Uh, like I said, this is a second chance campaign. So the first campaign was launched last year. So basically, uh, you know, whatever we make here should be enough to, to, to get this fulfilled and out to people. 
And then, you know, like I said, we're working on a big number one. It's going to be me and Joe Ball uh, telling uh, a really, really badass uh, story, kind of continuing this uh, this Bud Bone universe. And it's going to be uh, sick. I can't wait to start sharing some of that stuff with people. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um... So last time you were on, you told me a bit about Funder Comic. Uh, I've been noticing more people uh, gravitating to there lately. Uh, it, it, so are you there because of, like, I know that Clownfish TV had troubles with Indiegogo, among other people. Uh, are you kind of on Funder Comic because of that experience or a different reason? Uh, no, uh, you know, I had my two campaigns, the Ace Volume 1 and Volume 2 on Indiegogo. You know everything was good with them, but you know, uh, you know, by the it's been a while since I launched a campaign there, and there's definitely been a lot of kind of like shadiness from their side. A lot of people getting their campaign shadow banned, and just a lot of it's hard to get any any feedback or any kind of like response from them. It's been super weird over the last kind of year or so. So this new platform to end up, and you know, I know Luke. You know, I'm down with what he's trying to do. So I kind of did our Raider the White Leopard as my first test. When everything right. went great there, yeah, the fulfillment seemed to really go through on that one. Oh yeah, yeah. I got my copy. Yeah, and uh, got, I got mine too. Yeah, yeah, I think I got like uh, a dozen copies, orders, I should say, left to fulfill. So everything will be out by the end of the year. Nice. Yeah. So, so I guess so. Your experience with my comic has been positive. Yeah, like uh, I just love the, the, how easy it is to set up a campaign. Anybody who's been through with Indiegogo knows that it's not easy. Setting up a campaign page takes took me yeah. weeks. You know, it's it's just not it's not user friendly or creator friendly. But from yeah, my comic, I can set up a campaign in one day and, and have it ready to go. So, yeah, I wonder yeah. if part of it is I'm just pulling up Indiegogo here. Um, uh, I, and I'm not logged in as anybody right now, since it's, since I don't use this browser except for streaming. Uh, I'm just immediately noticing that a lot of their campaigns on here are more like tech based with a comic book over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like yeah, that's what, I, I, yeah. That's what they're showing off more. Yeah, and I remember um, it was it was mainly a tech crowdfunding site before before your boy Zach. Uh, Put his put the jawbreakers on there. Yeah, see, I almost I almost wonder if they're cynically uh, like, well, the comic books don't make us that much money anyway, so let well, why treat them? Why treat them well? Yeah, which I mean, it, 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 that's uh, that's not exactly good business practice. No, no especially yeah. when you're trying to make a dent into what Kickstarter has basically owned. You know, you'd think like anything that kind of helps you cut into that marker share, you'd be happy with. You yeah, think? Yeah. Have, think. Have, yeah. have you ever considered uh, doing something on Kickstarter? Uh, Daniel's done a campaign on there successfully. Yeah, yeah I'm going to test out Kickstarter probably in the next year or two. Uh, now that I've built up more of a catalog, I kind of feel like it's time for me to start expanding into these different platforms, kind of see what they offer. So, yeah, yeah, you'll be seeing me and I in all sorts of places in the next two, three years. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea to diversify and yeah, you know, have it on you know multiple platforms. You know, just if nothing else, get more eyes on your on your yeah. comic books. Definitely. Yep, I mean, that, that is kind of the beauty of publishing is that once the comic book is made, uh, you know, every sale is net positive, right? Because you just have mm -hmm. to uh, have copies sitting around. Yeah. Yeah, the the art is the the art and the book design is the expensive part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we could probably go through the tiers. Yeah, uh, let's take a look here. So we've got the uh, the basic here, the second cat chance ash can. You know, I, I don't think I've gotten a comic book that uh, did an ash can before. Uh, so for those watching who aren't familiar with the term, so this is like a standard sized American comic. Uh, oh, maybe I shouldn't be showing Lady Alchemy on stream. Oops. <laughs> That's just what I had ready to hand. 
<laughs> but so you have your standard American comic book. Uh, uh, how big is your ash can? Oh, well, I got the examples in hand. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you're, so when you're ordering one, uh, if you're, if you're getting the second chance ash can, you're getting the smaller one where if you go down here, let's see it. I think it's two of two those. Ash cans. Okay, you can get two of the ash cans. Yeah. Um, looks like the, yeah, this, uh, it looks like all the trading cards are sold out. I have a couple more. If you a little a further down. Yeah. Okay. And you got the blank cover ash can. Uh, is that going to come with a sketch, or is that more just like show show up at a convention and get it sketched on? Yeah, that's for anybody who kind of wants to, uh, to commission their favorite artist. Uh, you know, I've, I've looked into doing it, and it, the cost was really cheap. So I thought, okay. you know, my, I'll probably have a couple people I have in mind that, that I'll actually look to get commissions for my own sake. But yeah, it's just cool. It's something to do with the logo. I think it looks cool with the blood dripping on it. So I guess it's just a little, I think those are limited to like 25. So they're super like limited. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my favorite one here is the, oh, that's the skeleton. Like the skeleton with this mouth just <laughs> wide open. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. More cards, cards. Yeah, those came out great by Anthony Figaro. I did a great job with those. Yeah. Let's see here. So second page. Okay, so huh, I thought I moved on to the second page, but it uh, uh the of the tiers. Am I already on the hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Website seems to be broken. <laughs> Yeah, I got the same problem. Okay, um, so is there a tier that gets you the full size comic book, or? Uh, no, it's just an ash can. Okay, okay, that's that's what I was trying to figure out. Okay, so last time around it was the full issue or full size comic book. This time it's just a smaller ash can. Yep. Uh, like okay. I said, when I uh, came up with the idea for like Bloodbone for the first campaign, it was uh, borrowing a lot from like people like Joe Sontag and Sean Aaron had done, they put out like these limited ash cans. So I wanted to kind of take that idea, but instead of doing like, you know, like a preview ash can, this is like, like uh, based off the old wizard point fives or like the zero issues they, they used to do, where you get like gotcha. an exclusive story that was only exclusive to them in an ash can form before the big number one came out a couple of months later. Image used to do a bunch of those. They're super like hard to find and like they're actually very expensive right now. If you go on eBay, try check them down because they're like very limited collectors run. So I put yeah. it at the uh, blood bone as like a foil ash can. So it's like super limited. It's, it's yeah, really cool okay. like this piece. Yeah. Now so I understand. This, yeah. So this second second chance is gonna be also ash can, like I said. I won't have the foil that's exclusive to the first run, but it'll have this new cover and then it's got four additional pages of story that are also exclusive. Like these won't be reprinted unless I do like a big blood bone hardcover eventually down the line. Like gotcha. you won't get a chance to get these. I don't, I'm not sure if I'll even offer them when I do blood bone number one next year. I really want these to be like super exclusive and limited. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. So this isn't the greatest song ever. This is the tribute to the greatest song ever. Yeah. <laughs> Just a tribute. <laughs> okay. Now I'm wrapping my head around this a little better. <laughs> Let's see. Well, um, well, it looks like a cool comic with some neat art and a and a winning premise, because who doesn't love seeing somebody clean up the streets? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I can think of some people who don't, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the corporations are so isn't going to be happy. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's kind of like the fun about this story is, you know, like I said, I wanted to do like a one eighty for from like Ace. Even though I, I love everything that I'm doing right now with the Ace, it is outer space. It's spaceships aliens all this kind of crazy stuff then you go like complete street level with blood bone like there's right. no big superpowers or anything here you have a bunch of like enhanced humans with different skills and stuff this is completely all street level uh blood bone doesn't really talk a lot he's basically driven by his actions uh and yeah so if you get to have some some real kind of fun uh but it doesn't take itself too too serious one thing i 
I'm not a fan of is just like the the kind of like over the top, just killing and murdering for like no reason. It just becomes like a, just a miserable comic with no fun, no nothing super heroic about it. It is still superheroes, even though like Blood Bones like an extremist, you know. So you get to have like some of the lighter moments, some some comedy, some humor in, in between like uh, the the violence and stuff, so where where it doesn't get like too too like bogged down and dark. Yeah. Okay. Like I'm noticing here, like um, Donald having a lot of fun with the sound effects. Yeah. Tat 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 tat. More Uzi sounds. Grab. Yeah. Um, yeah. Clothesline. <laughs> yeah, the clothesline is great. When, when that's the first page you sent me, I was, I was dying with the clothesline. I was like, that's hilarious. Uh, was that his idea or yours? Uh, that was his. Like all, all the uh, the little sound effect things there. That's all Donald. It wasn't the letter or anything. Donald really wrote those into like the grab there all that kind of stuff that was uh, <laughs> all about him. nice yeah man like i think like anybody who's a fan of donald uh, i think like this is his best work i think he really shines in during the, this story and yeah, hopefully get to do some more stuff with him in the future but this is right in his wheelhouse man like when people see yeah. this it's just yeah. beautiful right. work slabs of beef violence with a little bit of silliness that, that yeah. definitely the yeah Definitely reminds me of that. Um, oh, what was that comic book he did with the big bounty? Brutus the Badass. That's yeah, it. Brutus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we, we endorse this uh, product or service. Go, yes, um, indeed. We'll, yeah. we'll have the link uh, in the video uh, in the video uh, for the for both the uh, video on demand of. Uh, uh, of this uh, live stream, as well yeah. as when we separate it out. Yes, as, and uh, as is our custom. And I'm putting the link in the chat right now. So, yes, go fund his comic. Indeed, yes. Yeah, and uh, you got about, you got a couple of months left on it, looks like. Yep, uh, this campaign is running for 90 days, so the first 30 days are done. You got another 60 to go, and then it's uh, closing one of the things i like about fun my comic again is like it's super easy like i set a start date and time and i set an end date in time and it takes yeah. care of it by itself i don't have to contact anybody to close it like you know once that ticker went down the campaign's done it's kind of i can yeah. breathe i don't have to worry about checking any boxes or doing anything yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, that's why i noticed about a lot of indiegogo campaigns is they don't seem to start and end when you expect them to yeah yeah, you know, fun. My comic is super, super easy. It just kind of takes takes all that worry and stress out of your hands, which is uh, good. You can just focus on promoting. And like I said we're, we're like less than two hundred and fifty bucks away, and we got a couple of months to go, so we we should be good. Like I said, uh, to, the campaigns all the art and everything's already done for this. Uh, I I just ordered the proof for the uh, for the uh, blank sketch covers. And mm -hmm. I'll probably be ordering the proofs for the uh, for the main comic probably January. So I should have it hoping to start shipping out sometime in February. At least get the first couple ones out. So it should be a quick turnaround for this. So one of the things about me, you know, it's not just about putting out these books; it's about fulfilling them. You know, I have three fully fulfilled campaigns. Raid of the White Leopards got like a dozen orders left to complete that'll be my fourth fully fulfilled campaign and then like i said february start doing my fifth fully fulfilled campaign it's about you know getting the books in people's hands yeah yeah you you earn a lot of goodwill with backers if you fulfill uh, especially fulfill in a timely manner i've noticed yeah yeah yep and uh you were very good about uh, when you needed a little bit of extra information for my thing. You just reached out to me, and it was easy. Yeah, yep. same here. Yeah. So, are you doing the uh, fulfillment entirely in house? Yep, I'm uh, running out of my apartment. I'm not at the level where a lot of these guys, you know, they need like warehouses and stuff. You know, it's not too crazy. Uh, so, you know, I'm able to handle them here. But you know, I'm hoping one day I, I can hire out R R RJ. You know critical blast and be like hey brother <laughs> things are crazy you want to take this yeah. you know but we're not there yet so you know i can i can handle a couple hundred books uh in my in my place for sure now yeah you'll get there yeah yeah oh, yeah yeah 
Yeah. Oh yeah. So like I was saying, we we endorse this product and/or service. Uh, it looks like a cool comic. So if it looks like it scratches your '90s itch, go give it a go. Indeed. Yeah. All right. I, I would even say it looks better than most of the '90s things that inspire it. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Like I said, I'm super happy I was able to get Shelby to do the cover for that. Uh, he did the colors and everything and really kind of took it to the next level. Like it really kind of fits that aesthetic I'm going for. Like I said, it kind of reminds you of the nineties, but it's also more updated because Shelby has like a more updated modern style to that, 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 that works for him. So this is kind of like a good blend of everything I'm trying to do with this book. Yep. Yeah. Th that is the thing I've noticed about kind of the comic skate and the newer round of it. It's like, it's like a refined version of what comics were like in the nineties. Uh, like um so, so there's a there's an anecdote i heard in, so uh, th this is a meme i saw so who knows if it's true uh, mm -hmm. the the creators of uh, a lot of the cartoon cartoons on cartoon network in the 90s like dexter's lab and johnny bravo and everything they had it because they're working at cartoon network they had full access to the uh, Hanna barbera vaults there at the studio so they could go there and watch things and they were excited because they you know all these cartoons they hadn't seen since they were a kid kids and one of them goes in there and he starts watching hong kong fooey then he immediately stops he says we can't watch these cartoons we, we have to pretend we have to be able to pretend that they were good <laughs> <laughs> or else it will just i have to continue to believe that these comics were good or else it will destroy my creativity and yeah. then they had like the model on the wall make the cartoons we thought we watched as kids <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that's what I feel like a lot of this like night like neo nineties comicsism is. Yeah, yeah. Make make the comic make the comics that we were we we think we remember reading. <laughs> yep. They're definitely uh inspired to make them better. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to, yep. because the fact that for, for any flaws that those books had, one thing they didn't lack was excitement. And one thing they didn't lack was they look great. Uh, you know, some sometimes uh, you know there were too many ideas, and they needed better editing, yep. which is I think probably like their biggest flaw to me. Were always they needed like a a gym shooter, somebody who could kind of like had control the whole line and can be like, look, guys, no, you can't. There's no reason for you to add like a fifth new character in your fifth issue. There's been one new character a book. Like, relax. You know, add right. characters after like ten or twenty issues. Do, you know, do you really like, need a young blood and a yeah. team young blood. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Was, a lot of stuff guys were just doing because like they didn't have somebody like was more experienced and kind of like calm them down. Like you don't have to get all this on the page, brother. You can relax. Uh, and then the other ones kind of like just like no real motivation to kind of get issues out to people. They were making so much money that they were just like. Yeah, we'll put out two issues a year. And you're just like, you know how much money you've left on the table? Yeah. yeah. Like if you would have just put out six issues a year, yeah. you know how much more right. money you, you would have made? Like, there's just no enough sense of, like, so they needed, like, a big brother. Like I always said, like, what they should have done was, 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 was hire somebody who could kind of, you know, get, be a big brother to them and just be like, look, guys, yeah. you got to. Yeah. But, you know. Of course, you know, the whole reason they left Marvel is they, did, they thought they knew better than their big brother. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they kind of did. That was the problem because Marvel was like, Marvel was like the, the, the old, uh, the uncle that had their heyday, <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. Like, yeah, you, you were, you did great 30 years ago. <laughs> you're, not, you're not, you're not doing what we're doing now. Tell me that in between, you know? Uh, well, I mean, they just run off Chris Claremont from the X Men and, uh, Boy, that that was ultimately a mistake. Oh yeah, <laughs> and uh, and Jim Shooter had been sacked a few years earlier, so they 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 didn't have the best leadership at the time, and they didn't know how to keep them around. Yeah. Oh oh well, their their yeah. loss is what was everyone's gain because um, you, you know that they was, as long as they were smart with their money that, that those early '90s man they just never had to think about money again. There's a reason that Rob Liefeld can do a uh, 
a six issue GI Joe miniseries for IDW just because he always wanted to draw snake eyes. You know, he's not being paid what he's really worth for that. No. <laughs> yeah. no, there's no money in uh, making comics for IDW these days. No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, um, I think that I, I think I've run out of ways to shill this. Uh, yeah. Anything you want to say to the audience before we call it a night? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to uh, you know, be on the lookout for Blood Bowl number one by me and Joe Ball. Uh, I think you know we're gonna uh, we're gonna rock some people's minds <laughs> with the stuff that we're doing. And uh, like I said, uh, this is gonna be like a great introduction to to the characters, like an exclusive story. So if you know you're interested in that, uh, give it a shot. It's pretty uh, reasonable pricing on this, uh, all things considered. Oh and uh, the turnaround is going to be super quick too. So so you'll get this in your yeah. hand, guaranteed in a couple months. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh nice. my God! I just realized when you said next year, I thought it was so far away. Tomorrow December starts. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did 2023 yeah. just vanish for anybody else? In a, in a blink. Yeah. Right? In a blink. 2022. Yeah, mm -hmm. it did. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I guess it's time to go enjoy the last of November. Uh, thanks for joining us, Edwin. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you, Edwin, for joining us. Yeah. And, and uh, Ninja and D. Rhino and anybody else who joined in tonight. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, uh, you know, hit that like button, uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, hit the bell for notifications, um, back to this comic book. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye, everybody. Yep.